All right, dear Miss Pinky. Um, as I said, you should have received an email with me for uh, the slides for today, and I sent a separate one with the slides from last week, and I will send out before the next two webinars as well for note-taking purposes. Um, and then just as we did last time, if you aren't logged in separately under your own name, but you're watching over someone's shoulder, please do put your name, and it is helpful to have an agency as well uh, in the chat so we can take attendance. All right, uh, I'm gonna begin. So I'm going to try to share my screen. All right, that looks like it worked. So always, uh, always a question with the technology. All right, you'll notice that today, uh, some of our initial slides are very similar looking to last week's, and that's because paint and glass have similar um, analytical processes. We, we use different instruments, and because they're different types of evidence, some of the, the procedures are different. But as far as the overall scientific method and the way we think about the evidence, there are a lot of similarities between the glass evidence that we talked about yesterday and the paint evidence that we're going to talk about today. So just a reminder, the trace evidence section is in our Portland Crime Lab, and we have um, seven main areas. Um, and we're going to talk about paint today, and then we will talk about physical match and make model searches next week. And then our last fourth presentation is on trace miscellaneous. So you'll remember that all trace evidence and really all forensic evidence is based on this premise that when there is contact between two objects, that material is going to be exchanged between them. And that evidence could be biological evidence uh, like DNA or latent prints or hair with DNA. And from that biological evidence, you have the potential to associate uh, the trace material, the biological trace, with a particular individual. Uh, with physical evidence, you don't have that chance to tie the evidence to an individual person, but instead you have the potential to show contact that there, to show that there was contact during an actual event. Uh, uh, someone has their microphone on. You wouldn't mind muting yourself or getting some feedback. Thank you. Um, and we really would like to emphasize that the two types of evidence work in tandem with one another. So sometimes the biological evidence is going to answer your investigative question of who did what. And other times, the physical evidence has a better chance of answering that question because either there may not be biological evidence in the contact or that biological evidence may not be probative or, or useful in answering the questions. Um, and then with paint specifically, we know that the transfer of paint happens typically with forceful contact. So it can be linked to a particular event or time that caused that paint damage. Or if the paint in question is wet paint, we know that that can only be transferred in the, the wet form uh, during a particular time period as well before it dries. So to emphasize, um, trace evidence can assist in your investigations in lots of different ways. You saw the same slide last week, but just to kind of emphasize the high points, um, what we can do with trace investigation is to provide evidence of physical contact between individuals or objects. Paint is especially good at showing two-way transfer, and we'll talk about that quite a bit today. It's also especially useful when you have contact where no biological evidence was transferred, and that is very common in the paint evidence scenarios that we receive, which are quite often vehicle to vehicle impacts or vehicle to bicyclist or vehicle to pedestrian impact. There's no suspect biological evidence left at the scene or transferred to the victim. And so we're dependent on the physical evidence to help fill in the gaps that are there. We also look at physical evidence when the biological evidence doesn't answer the question or when we need to tie evidence to a crime in order to make the DNA codas eligible for searching. And we have a nice example of that with a paint case today. 
Uh, we'll talk more about number six next week, but paint evidence can also provide investigative information about unknown vehicles. And it can corroborate or refute, refute statements from uh, witnesses, suspects, victims, everybody. And number eight, uh, we're gonna speak mostly today about the comparison of, of paint, but paint evidence can also be classified. And then number nine, just to emphasize all around that we do work all sorts of crimes in the trace evidence section. Everything from um, criminal mischief, spray paint cases to hate crimes to um, homicides. And we work a lot of hit and run fatality cases involving vehicles. And I think we would just like to emphasize to you, our, our, our partners, uh, we really do see us as existing to serve the needs of the law enforcement and criminal justice communities. We are here to assist with your investigation. So I know I speak with, for all the trace um, analysts in paint and glass that we, we want to work your cases. It's how we become experts. It's how we build our depth of knowledge. So please don't hold back your evidence in any case just because you feel as though it may not rise to the level of, of needing to be worked. Uh, we, we would like your evidence and we would like to have you understand what we can do for you in those situations. All right, so this slide may look familiar as well. So just to start us off, um, when we think about paint in, in specific, it falls into this general category of forensic analysis that is the comparison of a known sample or the standard that is collected with a question sample. So with paint, the example shown here is that we have a, um, a wall where there has been some tagging going on and a paint sample is collected by the law enforcement um, personnel. So a scraping is taken and if multiple colors are sprayed on the wall, we would want a sample or a standard of each of those colors. And then later a suspect may be uh, apprehended and the clothing, the garments, the shoes of that person are sent in for paint screening, or maybe the officer even notices, oh, I think there's some, some spray paint here, or I see some smears on the gloves or, or the shirt. Um, we would take a look at the paint on the garments, and that would be our question sample. And we're gonna compare the known standard or standards of different colors to any question paint that we found on the clothing. I'm now going to turn it over to Carly to talk more about what paint is. Here is a picture of just some of the different types of paint that we've seen in the laboratory. And we'll talk um, more about that as well, obviously. One thing that's really great about paint evidence is just the abundance of it that's in our surrounding worlds, from the vehicles that we drive to the tools that we might use, and even the walls on the building you're likely sitting in is painted. And like Chris mentioned, Anytime there is forceful contact between an object and something that's painted, there's likely to be a transfer of that paint. And the main situations that we in the laboratory see cases coming in are hit and runs. So you'll have the paint from suspect vehicle that may be transferred onto somebody's property or onto a pedestrian's clothing, or we've even had um, paint that's transferred to the, the bicycle involved. Um, we can also have paint travel the opposite direction. So in an instance where you have uh, two vehicles that are in contact, um, you can have a two-way transfer. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, coming up. And then we get a lot of uh, paint from forceful entries uh, where somebody's used maybe a, a pry bar on a painted door trying to break in. Um, but there's all sorts of different types of paint analysis that we can do in the laboratory um, regarding spray paints, um, nail polishes. We can even look at and do analysis with decals that are either on cars or maybe a business. Uh, boat finishes, probably not super likely to have that come across, but you never know. We, we can analyze paint on boats. And then any type of 
powder coating that could be applied to appliances, safes, filing cabinets, things of that nature, we're also able to analyze, and as well as any sort of road paint that you might find um, in possibly like a hit and run. Some situations are going to, you're going to come across, you're going to be able to obtain the known sample first. So for a case where you are dealing with a forceful entry, you might come across like the picture that's here, a door that's got some paint kind of chunked out of it. Uh, and you may not have any idea about what item was used to pry that door open. However, you would want to collect a standard of the paint from the door now. And this is kind of one of the things that we find to be the, the biggest missed opportunity is collecting kind of trace evidence when the crime happens. And oftentimes, especially with trace evidence at the scene, it's very difficult to go back and collect it. Uh, so even if you don't know if you're going to need it, we really urge you to collect it now. And if later on you come across some sort of tool that might have been used to open the store, we can have the store standard to compare to possibly some paint that was found on the tool. Uh, in a situation such as a pedestrian fatality, you might end up with just the question paint left at the scene. And this could be flakes of paint that are popping off the car from the collision or even paint that has transferred to the clothing the person was wearing. Uh, so you would want to collect that now. And then as a suspect vehicle is developed, we're able to compare what was left at the scene to the standard from the car. So always kind of think about what you can collect now and how that might help you later on if you were to develop um, either a question source or a known source. This is a good opportunity, or this is a good example of, of two-way transfer. So you have a forceful entry of a painted safe that a yellow pry bar was used to try and pry it open. You can end up with the yellow paint transferring off the tool onto the gray safe. And it could be that you have the gray paint transferring onto the yellow pry bar. In a situation where you have two-way paint transfer, we're gonna need a minimum of four uh, samples. And we'll talk a little bit more about the sample collection um, as we go through this presentation. But um, just kind of keep that in mind that for, for any sort of two-way transfer, the number of samples we need will automatically double. So what exactly is paint? It is basically just a mixture of all sorts of different ingredients that work, that you're looking to get a desired property or for um, a specific use. So the majority of the paint is what we call a binder, and it's a clear polymer that will help coat the surface, kind of apply the paint in a nice way, will help it, the paint harden as it dries. There's also um, any number of pigments that can be added to give it a color or an opaqueness to kind of um, hide anything that's below or, or whatnot, as well as um, there's a lot of additions. You will see this oftentimes with vehicle paints, the kind of metallic sparkly effect that some paints have. Um, that is through additions with little metallic flakes, or they can even kind of be a pearlescent quality and we're able to look at that as well. Um, there's also all sorts of, depending on the, um, the use of it, and I'll talk a little bit more about this on the next slide, um, as far as an, any number of other ingredients that can be added to the paint. So all of these combine for just, you know, millions of different combinations of, of the paint that's around us. And we are able to kind of analyze and based on what's there, we can get a really good idea about what the paint was used for. So as I was saying, there's different um, ingredients that make up the properties. This would be, for instance, uh, vehicles that are painted in the factory or you know, from when the car is initially made, that paint that they use is gonna be drastically different than the paint that gets applied if you get into a fender vendor and you go to your local repair shop. Uh, we're able to look at the 
the chemicals that are in the paint. And we can tell based on that how and where the, the car was likely um, painted. Um, also, things for such as spray paints or architectural paint are going to have different requirements just based on the nature of their paint. So think about even how uh, a car has a metal hood. For most of your car is, is metal. The paint doesn't need to be as elastic there because you you don't really think of there being a lot of bending with, with the metal part of your car. However, the paint that would be on your bumper, which are oftentimes now plastic, that's going to need some more elasticity in the paint to kind of help it move. And so it doesn't just pop off um, with a little bit of um, manipulation. So the paints are definitely formulated for what surface it's going to be applied to. Uh, however, we do want to caution you to just keep in mind that paint is mass produced. And so while there are all sorts of different combinations of this and we can you know, give you an association between paints. We cannot make a direct one-to-one -one link between a known and a question sample. There are certain situations where we might be able to give you an expert opinion and that there's maybe something rare about the paint. And we have an example of that later on in the presentation. Um, the way that the paint gets mixed, um, will affect our analysis sometimes. And we especially see these with things such as spray paints and architectural paint where the user is mixing the paint themselves. Um, this kind of presents some challenges for us sometimes in the lab if we don't have a sufficient standard. Um, and we will again kind of talk a little bit more about uh, if you have a spray paint or an architectural paint, um, and you have access to the actual can of paint or the spray paint can, we would love you to send that in uh, as is so that we can make a proper uh, standard. We really don't expect there to be a lot of variation in paint on things that are commercially painted. So the vehicles that are coming out of the factory or any tools that are made um, commercially, the variation is very minimal because uh, the mixing process is just done so well on their end. But each step of the way um, through our analysis, we're, we're looking for any differences between the questions and the known paint. So this can be, you know, once we look at a sample underneath the microscope, they might both look red, for instance, but maybe we can see something um, underneath the microscope that we can't tell with our naked eye. But we're really just trying to keep going through and we're trying to really prove that they could not have come from each other. And we keep doing that with the different instrumentation that we have available to us in the lab. And again, we'll go through a little bit more about what our analysis looks like later on. Um, oftentimes, if we don't have proper standards, um, but there is some question as to what type of paint this is. We can also analyze something and say, based on the ingredients in this paint, this is architectural paint, or this likely came from um, road paint. But having things come in and allowing us to screen them underneath the microscope, especially for smears of paint or um, any sort of like little chips, Having us look at it and being able to um, help answer that question is, is really good for you. And like Chris said, we love the practice of getting to analyze these paint samples. And I'm sure I speak for myself, but I'm sure I'm not saying anything wrong by saying that. Chris and I could talk about paint for, <laughs> for hours and hours. Um, it's just it's really, really fun to analyze in the lab and we just don't get to see them near enough. All right, I think back to Chris. Carly is so correct. We are total science nerds, as I'm sure you have already guessed, but um, we love paint analysis and glass analysis, and, and it was hard to limit ourselves to 90 minutes for each presentation. Um, all right. So we're going to start diving into the deep detail with vehicle paints because those are the sorts of 
vehicle uh, sorts of paint samples that we receive most commonly and we have the most experience and also the most um, research has been done using vehicle paints as the substrate. Uh, and we'll talk about the other types of paints throughout. Um, but let's start with what we do when we receive a vehicle paint piece. So the first thing we do is un under the microscope, we will characterize the layer structure of that paint. Uh, we decide whether it's on a metal substrate, like a metal body panel of your vehicle, or if it's from a plastic substrate, such as a bumper or a side mirror, something like that. Um, and we do that by turning the paint on its side, basically looking at it on edge. And we look at how many layers of paint are there and what are the colors and orders and, and various thicknesses. Then still under the microscope, we will use a very sharp scalpel and a very steady hand. And we will separate the layers by peeling each layer separately. So. Um, if there's four layers, we are scalpeling down until we get a sample of each of the four layers that are separate from one another. We will then conduct chemical and elemental analysis of each layer. We will use the chemistry that Carly spoke about to determine is that paint OEM versus repaint. And if you're not familiar with the term OEM, that means uh, original equipment manufacturer. So basically, is it factory paint or is it repair paint? We'll also make observations of any unusual characteristics. This might affect our final conclusions. And then if we're comparing a Q and a K, we will compare the data we receive for each layer pair to each other. So if I have a typical vehicle paint system, like a factory paint system on a metal body panel, it is most commonly a four layered uh, paint structure. And in the image to the left, the bottom left, there, there are four layers, but the top one is somewhat difficult to see. So there's a thick, clear paint layer, which is a protective layer, it protects the, the colored layer uh, from sun damage and from scratches, rock chips, that sort of thing. Then in this example, we have a metallic blue, which is the base or color coat layer. And then there's two primers. The main primer here is white and the electric coat primer here is gray. And then in a, in a uh, real life example, this would be um, on top of a metal substrate, the metal body panel, steel or whatever it happens to be. So we're going to scalpel down the clear layer of our Q and of our K, and we're going to analyze them and compare them to one another. Then we do the same thing for the blue, the same thing for the white, the same thing for the gray. Any differences either in the visible layer structure or in the analysis that we do and we conclude that these could not share a common source. But if we can't tell any difference through those four layer comparisons, then we associate the Q and the K. So again, typical layer structure is those four layers. And if it's OEM, we know that this paint system will exist on other vehicles that were manufactured to have the same color and paint properties. Now, usually this means that the vehicles in a given plant, a given factory on a given line, um, so making the same model, will have the same paint uh, structure. Um, but of course, the factory is also producing vehicles in different colors. So they may, may not be all blue or all black. You'll have a variety in that base coat layer, but the other three layers would be the same for other vehicles coming off that same line. We'll talk about that, how that is useful and not useful next week. As Carly mentioned, it's really important to remember that even on a single vehicle, there will always be multiple paint layer structures. This slide says almost always, but pretty much nowadays it's always because most vehicles will have plastic panels as well as uh, metal panels. And as she explained, the paint ingredients are going to be different on those two substrates for various reasons having to do with the elasticity that they need and other properties. So we have had cases where we find um, a colored paint on a victim's clothing, but the standard that we receive from the law enforcement agency is discriminated, it's different. And in some cases that could be that we received a standard from a plastic body panel, but the paint on the clothing was actually from a metal body panel. So if you're in a situation where there is 
damage to both metal and plastic body panels of a vehicle, we do need standards from both. We also um, already went over how OEM paint and repair paint is different chemically, but remember that uh, repairs may be done on only one body panel of a vehicle or that repair may affect multiple body panels. And we'll look at that more closely, I think, in the next slide or two. So we do need a separate paint standard for each damaged body panel so that we can entirely represent the known paint on the car and compare it with the queue. The last thing we want is to kind of falsely discriminate and rule out a, a vehicle if it's uh, just discriminated because of the standard that we receive and not an actual lack of that type of paint on the vehicle itself. But please always package each standard separately and of course label it, um, you know, this is the paint standard taken off the right front quarter panel, this is the paint standard from the front bumper, that sort of thing. If we do receive paint where we can tell there is an aftermarket repair going on, um, there's a wide variation in the quality of those repairs. So sometimes it's just someone making a spot repair in their garage. Um, we've even seen spray paint used to kind of cover up uh, damage or scrapes on vehicles, or it could be anywhere up to they take it you know, to a professional repair um, factory company and do the repair. And that uh, is going to, going to create a repair that is probably much more pleasing to the naked eye because that paint will blend in better. Uh, and it's also um, probably gonna cover a larger area of the vehicle. But the paint chemistry that we see with our instruments can help us figure out what's going on. So usually when a repair is done on a vehicle, it involves sanding off some or all of the OEM paint layers around the area of damage. Then body fillers or epoxies are used to kind of smooth out that area where the sanding took place. It can also affect the adjoining body panels in order to achieve that seamless look, that appearance to the eye. And once that repair is completed, that area is now more likely to lose paint in future impacts because when OEM paint is applied to metal panels in the factory, it is baked on. That's one of the properties that we can tell from the paint chemistry. And because it's baked on, it is very firmly held to that metal panel. But a repair paint can't be baked on because now the car has a, uh, you know, upholstery and fabric and all sorts of plastic parts on the inside and wiring and everything. So you can't bake the whole car again just to set that paint. So the paint chemistry will be different and it just doesn't stick as well. And so if there is an impact that hits a repaired area, the paint is more likely to pop off than original paint. However, original paint will pop off. And by that, we mean the metal panel is flexed or bent due to the force of the impact and the paint can't bend with it well enough. And so it loosens and comes off in chips and flakes. And we love to see that. They're often found on the road after the scene. They are huge in the world of trace evidence and give us plenty to work with. So keep your eyes open for those chips uh, at the scene of any kind of vehicle to vehicle impact or vehicle pedestrian uh, hit and run. And repair paints may also show us microscopic signs of sanding. You may even be able to see drips or sanding marks with the naked eye. And that uniqueness of a repair that's done poorly can add to the significance of our conclusion. So just to kind of give some visuals to what we were just talking about, here's a staff person uh, sanding down a scratch or a dent in one area. So the OEM layers of paint are being removed from that area. And you can see it's quite a large area, uh, even if the damage is small. That's why your quote is going to be so huge, because this, this takes a lot of time and effort to do. Uh, then that area is patched with body filler, et cetera, and then sanded again uh, with various uh, levels of grit to make it perfectly smooth before repainting. 
then the repainting begins and um, depending on how extensive the damage was, they may apply primer layers or they may start with the base coat layer and then the clear layer will have to happen on top. So in this example, let's imagine that the damage was done here, but you'll notice this is kind of a silver metallic car. And if the repair paint was only added to this spot on the door, your eye would be able to pick up the difference because no matter how good the repair professional is and how close the paint chemistry happens to be in the color match, it would, it would be obvious as the sun hit it and you looked at it with different angles. So what they do instead is they will feather their air um, application from the paint gun and they'll feather it onto adjoining panels as well. That's why they haven't taped off this quarter panel, even though there was no damage there. You'll notice though they have taped off uh, more toward the back of the vehicle. So what you'll see in this main repair area is under the microscope, all the OEM layers are missing and the paint layers that are present are only repair paint layers. But in an area like this, you will have the OEM layers and then the repair layers will be on top. So imagine that you have some damage here. We want a standard close to the area of damage because if you collect a standard from way over here or God forbid over here, we could start seeing different paint layer structures that you were unaware of. So that standard should come near the area of damage, as near as you can without going into the exact damaged area itself. So, so far we've looked at just examples with typical four layer OEM paints, but in real case work, we see other examples as well. And this is a case that I worked in 2016, which is kind of my upper limit of paint layers. And in this case, I had a vehicle that had 11 layers of paint on it. And this is looking where the paint chip is laying flat. And you can kind of see one um, bottom surface is the gray primer. And then you can kind of get a glimpse of some of the layers that were happening as you see it kind of like a, the side of a Grand Canyon or something like that. And then when we look at it on edge and we can count the layers and uh, note their colors, there were three OEM layers at the bottom, which were a clear white and gray primer layer. Then there were some repair layers of clear and white. And then we had some red start getting in the mix where we had um, the top, very top layer is clear. And then we had a metallic red, a red primer, a white and so forth. So if you can imagine what's going on with this vehicle, it originated as a white vehicle at one point, the white was repaired, and then all of a sudden, someone decided, nope, we want this uh, body panel to be red. Now, we're assuming that the whole car was repainted red, but of course, we can't tell this just from that chip. So in an example like this one, when I have a Q and a K, and they both have 11 layers, and I'm comparing all 11 layers to one another between the Q and the K, and they all share all visual, chemical, and elemental characteristics, that conclusion is a much more strong association than if we simply had four layers of factory paint. So we'll talk more about reporting near the end of the presentation, but the number of layers is a definite factor in how strong the association may be able to be made. And the other thing that can affect the significance of vehicle paint evidence and analysis is if we have that two-way transfer that Carly mentioned. So if you have paint from car one on car two and paint from car two back on car one, it reduces the coincidence argument where a suspect says, oh yeah, I, I hit a, a red car you know, just last week. It had nothing to do with this crime. It just, it's probably a coincidence that that paint looks just like you know, the paint in this, uh, this recent event. So if we see paint on the red car and paint on the other car, then we kind of um, help eliminate the chance that it's just a random coincidence. You can see too that the rarity of the paint could also be a factor. So this photo is of a, a recent model Tesla where they're utilizing that kind of, I think they call it um, 
color changing ink. Yeah. Um, we actually have never seen a sample of this in the lab yet, but we're so excited for our first one. Um, but wherever you stand, the, the color of the car is going to look different. Uh, and in this case, it kind of has a flame appearance. So it's not, it's not that the paint is different uh, on the, the different regions of the car. It's that your angle of incidence to the paint or how you're looking at it is a little different. So it, it changes because the pigment itself is reflecting light differently. So if we had a case like that, that's a very uncommon type of paint, and that would allow us to reach a stronger association than if it's your just typical run-of-the-mill black metallic paint. We do want to emphasize that there is a, uh, a common misconception. Um, when that clear coat, the clear top layer of paint, is abraded by friction, it can look white. And so if you're looking at a vehicle and you see damage and it looks white to you, Please don't be fooled into thinking automatically that you're looking for a white car that made that damage and you're seeing white transfer of paint. It could be a white car. There are a lot of white cars on the road, but we just want you to be aware that it is, um, it's kind of a pitfall because clear coats will also look white. But once we get it into the lab, we can tell the difference very easily between an abraded clear coat and paint from a white car. So that's vehicle paint, but just a, a quick summary of some of the other types of paint that we do analyze. Um, we'll get spray paint cases where we have micro droplets on garments. Um, you can see this is a highly magnified view of someone's uh, black boots. And there are multiple colors of spray paint micro droplets on there. There's lavender and blue and turquoise and red and brown and yellow and orange. And there were you know, they're just kind of layered one on top of each other. And this was um, an example in a vandalism case. Um, and we also see spray paint used in hate crimes. So please remember that as an option if you're trying to investigate those. We do ask that you submit, as Carly said, the entire spray paint uh, as, a, as a known if you have that available to you. If not, we can still compare the known from the wall or the business to the unknown, the question on the garment. We also see quite a few cases with architectural paint where we're looking at tools and looking for transfer from painted doors, painted window frames, painted filing cabinets. Um, all those painted objects can leave deposits on the tools. And as Carly mentioned, we could have two-way transfer where the painted tools leave deposits on uh, the door, window, et cetera. We have had some uh, wet architectural paint cases as well. Those are less common, but um, but we have had them, and they can pose a different a difficulty, as Carly said, because the criminal may not mix the paint very well at all, and um, they're just splattering around, or they don't shake that spray can until that ball rattles around sufficiently. So they're spraying, and the paint is mixed in some certain state. And then the officer might make a standard to submit to us that they really shake it like crazy. Well, now those two could look slightly different and we would rather have the can in the lab so that we can do that standard creation on our own and make it at several levels of mixing for full comparison. We do see uh, safe break-ins, gun safes, uh, you know, financial safes, business safes, um, all that sort of thing. And just a reminder that another section of the lab does tool marks analysis. And so those two types of analysis can work together. We know that nail polishes are a paint. Um, that could happen in a sexual assault where you have any kind of um, violent struggle going on. Also, acrylic type nails, fake nails could pop off completely and we can do analysis or comparison there. And in a very rare case, you could have paint chips that are large enough that we can do a physical fit. Now we'll talk about physical fits next week, but if you do see large paint chips, like the ones I mentioned that may pop off of a car, um, that, is a, that is a possibility that we wanna keep in mind. We've also used nail polishes or we've seen nail polishes used just as uh, markings. So I think it was a burglary case where someone had marked all of their tools in their garage with red fingernail polish as kind of a, this is my tool in case I loan it. And then there was a burglary where all those tools were stolen. 
and we were able to compare that um, owner's red nail polish that he had been using with the tools that had been recovered later that had some red, red paint on them and it turned out to be an association. All right, so Carly Kenny gave a preview of this, but now let's dive into more detail. When we're looking at a known paint compared with a question paint, we are first starting with that microscope to compare the colors and textures and layer structures. And this is true whether it's vehicle or architectural or spray paint or whatever. Then we take it to an instrument called the FTIR. And this is using an infrared beam to look at how the, the chemical mixture of the paint produces a spectrum for us. And that spectrum will vary depending on the ingredients in the paint. So some of the ingredients are very common and we'll see um, contributions from those in the paint spectrum, but others are more rare and the mixture will vary from paint sample to paint sample. We'll then look at that IR data and decide, okay, this is OEM paint or this is architectural paint, this is repair paint. The clues of what the ingredients tell us will help us make that determination. It's not 100% of the time possible, but very often it is. We'll then, if we haven't discriminated or told the difference between our paint samples yet, we will go on to another elemental profile examination using the XRF instrument, which we talked about last week with glass. And again, we're trying to see, can we tell any difference between the Q and the K? And if not, now we've finished all of our steps and we would associate the Q and the K samples. And as with glass, these procedures are based on standardized methods in the field. So here's an example of what that FTIR infrared data looks like to us. And we have two uh, white samples. And even though they're somewhat similar, like they all, they both have a, a large peak right around this region. Um, and they have some areas here that are similar. That would tell us that there could be some ingredients in common between these two paints. However, the areas that are circled, if I compare the fine detail of where the peaks are from one sample to the other sample, they are discriminated, they are different. So even though some ingredients may be in common, the mix of ingredients in the top white paint is different than the mix of ingredients in the bottom white paint. So those two white paints do not share a common source. So here's an example with white paint. This is one that I just worked last year. And let me go through the images. We have here a cutting that was taken from the suspect vehicle. And you can see that it looks like there's a white smear here that I've circled in green. Now, as I just said, the first thing that I wanna verify when I see a white smear is I wanna make sure that it's not just a braided clear coat. So that would be early on in my analysis. I'm gonna double check that this white smear is not just a braided clear coat of the vehicle in question. But in this situation, if I look really closely, I not only see the smear, I also see some very tiny chips. And I'm just zooming in to show that there are some white paint chips that are actually adhering to this cutting from the suspect vehicle. And the suspect vehicle, I think, was a, a dark metallic gray. So this is very small, it's about one millimeter, but in the trace world, that is plenty to work with. And so I'm going to, so I'm going to analyze that as my question sample. I have a questioned paint that is on the surface of my suspect vehicle. And then the other portion of this case was a mailbox that was damaged and it is painted white, as you can see, and there is paint loss from the impact. And this is a great example of the metal is bending, but the paint can't keep up. The paint is not, um, it's not formulated in order to bend and be elastic on this metal mailbox. And so the paint itself is going to pop off, as well as you can see it was scraped away in some areas. So the question is, could this white paint chip could this white smear on the suspect vehicle have come from the mailbox? And you might think, well, gosh, that's a lot of work to just uh, analyze for someone's damaged mailbox. But in this case, as you can see in this box, um, two pedestrians were struck 
prior to the mailbox being struck. So this was really um, one of the pedestrians ended up dying. So this was a death investigation. And so the mailbox just happened to give us some really nice um, evidence that kind of showed the chain of events um, as the vehicle went off the road. So with these two samples, we have the FTIR data again. The top one is showing um, the mailbox paint and the lower one is showing that white smeared area from the suspect vehicle. And again, if you, if you look closely from sample to sample, all the peaks between the two line up. They, um, they are not discriminated. There are no significant differences. And so in this case, the, the chip on the suspect vehicle was associated with the mailbox paint. Now, of course, I'm just showing you one example. We actually do this measurement multiple times to make sure that we're not um, just seeing some kind of weird little fluke in the data. We'll measure it and make sure we are getting reproducible results. The next step is then we go to the XRF and we're doing the same kind of analysis. We're looking at what elements are in the paint and just to build on some topics Carly and I have spoken about before, the mixing can definitely make a difference here because the most likely thing that would mix um, in an incomplete manner are those pigments. So for example, these are some slides we made out of some spray paint cans where we shook them for different amounts of time. And you can see this blue example, you know, if we didn't shake the can at all, we got this. Uh, and if we kept spraying from an unshaken can, we got this and this. And then we did a little bit of shaking and then we did full shaking. And if you were to look at these with the naked eye, you wouldn't even potentially guess that they're from the same can. This green example is, is a good one too. So again, we would prefer that the can or um, the, spray can, the spray paint can or the architectural paint can comes to us so that we can do that kind of uh, scientific mixing to create our comparison standards rather than you doing it before you send the evidence to us. These differences in pigmentation is not only visible, but also we would detect those differences on the XRF, the X-ray instrument as well. So here's the same evidence, the paint from the mailbox, the paint from the smear on the suspect vehicle, um, here's the XRF data that is overlaid between those two samples. And then we're just zoomed in here to show that those nicely overlap between the two samples and we cannot differentiate them via X-ray. Now, one of the pitfalls with something like a mailbox is it really doesn't have a layer structure. It's one layer of paint. And that is also true for many tools, um, painted, door frames, things like that, and they only have one layer, safes, uh, washing machines. So we don't have as many points of comparison. So in some situations, if we have a brightly colored paint, white isn't suitable, but if we had yellow tool paint, for example, we will take it to another instrument to do um, further analysis of the color. And this is just a way to measure scientifically what the color of the paint is, uh, more than just the, the color that we see with the naked eye. All right, so once we do all that work, what will our lab report say? So if we're screening evidence for the presence of paint, we'll report our probative findings. So if we're screening um, clothing from a hit and run, if we're screening a tool, for example, we will explain what we found. And then we will describe the layer structures of any, any paint that we observed. We will certainly explain if there's some kind of issue with the standard or if the question paint fragments that we found are too small to do our comparison. But paint fragments do not have to be very large in order for us to uh, do at least some comparison, if not a full comparison. And then our paint reports will also describe the instrumentation that we use. So all of that is kind of just requirements that we must put in our report. But what you're really more interested in, I bet, is the conclusion. What did we conclude from our analysis? So just like with glass, uh, if there are measurable or observable differences between the Q and the K, we will say that the known source cannot be the source of the question fragment or question paint, and this is an exclusion. 
And note, this can happen if the standard that we received was not the correct standard. So if we're comparing bumper paint on a victim to hood paint from a standard, you will see an exclusion because we have no idea if there's um, bumper paint on that vehicle that would have matched. We might ask you to go back to the suspect vehicle and collect a second standard if that vehicle is in your possession. Or if we cannot, through any of our testing, differentiate the Q and the K, the report will say that that known item or another damaged painted item with all the same properties could be the source of the question paint. This is an association. So that phrase in italics is where we're acknowledging that paint is mass produced. And so if you had some other painted item with everything the same, it could also be the source. But the key word there is damaged. Just like with glass, even though there may be other windows in the world with the same properties as the glass in your evidence case, the glass has to be broken in order for it to be a potential source and the paint has to be damaged in order for it to be a potential source. So the population of possible sources out there is not all windows, it's all broken windows, which is a much smaller group. So specifically for paint, the association means to you as a reader that the chemical and elemental profiles of all the corresponding layers, as well as any other features are indistinguishable from one another. So certain things may increase the significance or may decrease the significance of that association. And uh, we may include an expert opinion about this if we feel strongly about it. So some of the things that can increase the significance I've already mentioned, we could have a larger number of paint layers. We can ha could have a combination of OEM layers and repair layers. We could have very rare types of paint, uh, like that color changing paint, or we've seen other cases where um, someone's doing repair in their, in their home or in their garage, it's their own personal vehicle that they're restoring, and the paint that we saw had some unusual features there. We will also um, look for two-way paint transfer that increases the significance of the association. Or sometimes we may see a substrate that we will also compare. So an example of that would be, we had a vehicle that hit a um, pressure treated signpost that was also painted. And the chips found on the vehicle included some of that pressure treated wood. So we compared the paint and that was associated. And then we also compared the elements that we saw in the pressure treatment of the wood and they also were associated. So that increased the significance of our finding. But then some things would decrease that significance and that would be the last two here on the bullets. Um, if we had really common paints without many odd or unusual features or single layer paints, those would lessen the significance of our finding. So we talked a little bit about last week about environmental glass. Um, it's not really an issue for paint, except in situations where someone has been in contact with a road surface, because we know the roads are just coated with broken glass, broken paint um, from previous impacts. Um, and, and someone who's in contact with that road is going to pick that up on their clothing. So for us, that situation is most common when someone has been killed uh, or injured by a vehicle strike. And as we're screening their clothing for paint, uh, we're gonna see a lot of road paint as well. So if we have a suspect vehicle already, we know what color to look for as we kind of narrow our search uh, in our initial analysis to that color. If it's a situation where we don't have a suspect vehicle in development yet, so we don't know the color that, may have, uh, that we're looking for, then we use some other clues to help us figure out which paint looks uh, less worn or more fresh in that sample. So just like with glass, we do have some limitations on our um, analysis that we do for paint. We know it's mass produced. We cannot provide statistics just uh, as we couldn't for glass. Um, however, we can talk about if something is unusual in our experience based on our training and all that sort of thing. And of course, we can only make the measurements that our instruments allow. 
And there could be the, like, the chance that there is um, some difference in these two samples, our Q and our K, that our experiments cannot detect. However, multiple studies using the techniques that we use, done by the FBI and other uh, large organizations, show that the discrimination ability, or how good we are at telling two things apart, uh, of vehicle paint specifically, is over 95%. So we're pretty confident that um, our techniques are fairly sensitive. I mentioned last week that we are moving in the future to an association scale. So you may start seeing bits of this on our paint reports where we break an association down into further groups. So if I had an association with OEM and repair layers, it would fall into association with highly discriminating because this is more rare. A typical four layer OEM structure would be in the middle, association with discriminating characteristics. And then something like yellow tool paint, which is just one layer, could still reach an association, but it would be limited by the fact that there's just one uh, layer to compare between the Q and the K. And then of course, we still might have the possibility of an inconclusive, an exclusion or an elimination. So let's look at some case examples. So in, starting with this one, we have some missed opportunities in the paint world. We have at the top example, a blue car that was vandalized and a crowbar was seized from the suspect's possession to come into the lab for screening for paint. And we did find blue paint on the crowbar. However, no car paint from the damaged vehicle was submitted as a standard. So our report just explains what we found, but we really can't link the crowbar at all to this particular damaged vehicle. We can say whether the blue paint we find is vehicle paint versus architectural paint versus spray paint, but again, it's very easy to explain away um, other blue paint on the pry bar, which has nothing to do with the crime. And so we send the standard in. The second example is kind of officer error, uh, where there was a situation where a painted safe was pried open with a painted tool. And the officer used their own folding knife to collect the safe's paint standard, and then used the same knife without cleaning it to collect the scrapings from the tool. So we couldn't do any analysis because we had cross-contamination between the samples. And this was noticeable under the microscope, just the, the way the, the paint evidence presented in the paper folds. It was just mixtures that didn't make sense if they were collected separately. And so I reached out to the officer and, and kind of talked him through his process and we did figure out that he had failed to clean the tool. So don't, don't make that mistake. It's, I know, um, easy or you might you know, wipe it on your pants or whatever and think the tool is clean, but the really tiny bits of paint that we're looking at here, um, they, they need a more thorough cleaning between uses of a, a given blade. This next example is a scenario in which a, um, a paint analysis had an effect on CODIS eligibility. So this was a vandalism case in which uh, multiple cars in a parking lot were um, splattered and painted with white architectural paint. And this is a piece of the paint peeled, I think, from the, the asphalt of the parking lot. And then not at the crime scene, but some blocks away, this uh, cap was taken and you can see that there is paint on it. And when we look under the microscope, the paint is clearly um, dried in the fibers in a way that it was applied wet and then dried. So we know that this is not a transfer of paint from like rubbing against a painted object. This is transfer of wet paint. And so what we did was we were able to compare these two. This is your, um, your Q paint on the, on the cap and this is your known paint from the scene. And they were associated, which now means that this uh, garment can go for DNA testing and that DNA on it, it can be searched through the CODIS database. Without the pain association, there's no link that um, ties this garment to the crime and therefore it would be rejected for CODIS workability. 
So if you're working hit and run events, particularly hit and run of um, a pedestrian, oh, a pedestrian or uh, a bicyclist, motorcyclist, where I apologize, I hope that's not too distracting. We have a car alarm going off outside the building here. Um, the paint could be smeared onto their uh, garments. And the image here is what that looks like to us under the microscope. We have a woven black fiber garment and the paint that is smeared on top of it is from um, a vehicle with kind of a turquoise or teal paint. And you can see it kind of melts into the fibers. Um, not, it doesn't look like when wet paint is applied, it looks very different, but because paint is plastic, if the impact is forceful enough, it will melt through the heat uh, of that impact. And then we already mentioned, but just to emphasize, please look for paint chips at the impact sites. Um, they can be repair chips or when that, um, when that metal panel or plastic panel bends. And then obviously look for broken vehicle parts. If they're painted, obviously that's great paint evidence. Even if they're not painted, they might have markings or codes on them that can help us do some work. And we will talk about that during next week's webinar. Another thing to keep in mind, which is related to paint evidence is that because that paint sort of melts upon impact, fibers may stick to it. So you might find fiber impressions or fibers themselves on the outside of a vehicle when the vehicle makes a high velocity contact with the clothing of a victim. That can also happen with hair. Hair can kind of stick to that melty paint that, you know, it's momentarily melty. It doesn't stay melted, but in the, in the heat of the impact. And then inside the vehicle, you might see that some fibers or some paint is transferred to passengers and drivers. So if you're the driver and you are thrown forward through the crash, through the steering column, or you're the passenger and your knees hit the dash or the glove box, there's a chance that paint from the car's interior could be transferred to the clothing or that fibers from the clothing melt onto the portions of the car. So if you're trying to figure out where were these people in the vehicle when the crash happened? There's lots of different ways to look at that. Uh, sometimes the airbags will help you, sometimes DNA, although in many instances, people in the car are in the car because they own the car, it's a family car, so DNA may not be an issue. Uh, but if there's blood, definitely that could help. But fiberplastic fusion is another way to help locate people at, this, at the time of a crime or the time of an impact, I should say. All right, we're gonna go quickly through some of these slides because I think we have made the point, but um, just a reminder that you may encounter a standard first at a scene, or you may uh, encounter the question paint first. So think about all pos possible scenarios. So scenario one, we've got a filing cabinet that's been damaged, you wanna collect the standard. Scenario two, we have a pedestrian that is dead. We wanna collect their clothing from either the hospital or the autopsy and send that into the lab to screen for paint. We'll also screen it for glass at the same time. Or scenario three, maybe that same filing cabinet is pried open, but you see a transfer to the filing cabinet as well. And in this case, in my example, it's yellow uh, paint transfer. So then we wanna collect both the file cabinet standard and the yellow paint, which is a question paint um, that we would hopefully compare later to a prime tool. I do wanna emphasize that some of the processes used to process for latent prints will destroy paint evidence. So I know some of your agencies do latent print processing on your own, please be cognizant that you may destroy the paint evidence and we won't be able to test it after you do so. So think about the order of testing that you want done. Um, we have had a couple instances in my recent memory where the agency sent in, it went to the latent print section first. So say you find a suspect, they've got a pry bar in their car and you send it into the lab for latent prints. Well, they'll do the latent prints and they'll find the latent prints of the suspect, but 
does that really help you? Because it was in it was in their car. So I think it would be better to first look for paint to try to tie that pry bar to a crime, uh, to do the paint comparison. And then uh, if necessary, we can try to associate that pry bar more conclusively with the person. But again, it was from their car. So think about the order of things and indicate that on your uh, Form 49 submission paperwork. All right. Okay, so let's get specific about what do we need you to collect from us or for us. Um, so as you know, the standard for paint represents the known painted object. We will need a standard for each color that is represented in an example like a spray paint vandalism situation. We'll also need a standard from each body panel of the vehicle if they show damage that is, you know, recent damage that you think is associated with the event. And those standards would, of course, each need to be packaged separately. And you would want to clean any tools between collection of those standards. To collect a paint standard, what we ask you to do is use a blade and scrape all the way down through the paint layers, all the way down through that substrate, whether it's metal or wood or plastic, whatever it happens to be, so that we're getting the entire layer structure in those scrapings. And you want to collect enough for us to work with uh, for about, um, if you were to combine all your scrapings together, imagine the size of a quarter. That's about how much we need. If you prefer, if it's easier, uh, cuttings are great too. So if you have a plastic bumper that's already damaged, go ahead and cut out a square. About a square inch is really all we need. We'll take as much as you'll give us, but the more you give us, the more um, comprehensive our testing can be. And I don't know how many of you have actually collected paint standards from metal panels of vehicles, but it does take a little bit of muscle. Um, so get ready to really press on that blade to get a nice deep scrape. Um, and again, if you have a Dremel tool, you'd rather take a cutting, that's absolutely fine with us. Those paint standards for spray paint and wet architectural paint, we keep saying, please submit the entire can. Don't empty it first. We just had that happen. Um, swabs do not work well for paint evidence, even wet paint, please avoid them. If you do have like a pile of wet paint on a, on a ground or something like that, um, you can wait till it dries and then take a scraping. Or if you put um, like a, a piece of, uh, like clear plastic and pick up some of the paint with that. Not adhesive, but just clear like acetate plastic. That would be great too. But swabs, we groan when we see swabs. They make it really hard for us to do our work. Each standard should be labeled with as much details as you know about where the paint came from. And if you do know the VIN of the vehicles in question, please include that with the evidence paperwork. All right, I'm gonna switch gears again and hand it off to Charlie. Okay, so I'm sure we, I mean, we've talked a lot about what to collect, but now let's talk about how to package those items and submit them to the lab. So with clothing or any sort of footwear that has paint on them or things that you would like us to screen, we would really like those to be in paper packaging um, it just, if, if there's any sort of wetness with the clothing, it just, it, it makes it easier for us and, and not as smelly. Um, we do ask you to do that. Um, be aware though, when using paper that there might be kind of some gaps in the seams. And so make sure you're kind of accounting for that. Uh, we will talk a little bit in a couple more slides about the double layer system. And so that's always an option too, that you could put your items in one paper bag and then Put that inside another one. Um, oftentimes for, for any sort of um, larger chips that you have found on the road from a hit and run scene, uh, they're often large enough that you can pick them up. So use you know your gloved fingers or tweezers um, to put them on a post-it note. We love um, when you guys use post-it notes to put your paint chips on. Uh, sometimes when they're just floating around in an envelope, it can be kind of hard to collect them all. Uh, so if if it's on a nice, on the adhesive side of the post-it note, 
uh, similar to kind of how Chris explained last week with the glass particles. And then there's another slide that will remind you how to do it again. Those work great, or even just paper folds. When possible, if possible, if the item is movable, it's not on a wall of a building, um, and you can submit the entire object, we are just fine with that. Our front office might grumble a little bit, as might the property rooms. However, sometimes it is just really nice that we're able to collect the standard or the transfer ourselves. Uh, sometimes those objects are easy to fit into a big paper bag or a box. Um, and that's great. And if you cannot, and the item is just way too large or, or too bulky, uh, cover the item as or the area of transfer as best as you can with some paper and tape it down. Just make sure that you're avoiding taping where the transfer is. As again, as um, Chris mentioned, sometimes the adhesive can really affect our analysis. Uh, for any sort of like a pry bar tool or something, those gun boxes work really great. You can strap the, the tool or object down in there so it's not moving around. Uh, those are wonderful as well. Um, so tape and adhesive lips are prohibited for paint. And the reason is, is that the chemicals that make up that adhesive share a lot of similarity with what we see in paint. So it kind of contaminates the paint and makes it really hard for us to tell what was in the paint and what is from the adhesive. And it could really make us not associate something that could have in fact actually shared uh, a common source. Uh, someone had asked in the chat about how to clean the tools that you use. Um, oh. um, I mean, we really do recommend even kind of using some um, disposable uh, little blades. And I don't know if everybody is going to be able to see the video, so I'll leave these here until we share again at the end. But single use um, scalp blades work great, as do even if you were to go to the hardware store and get like a big pack of just those, um, I don't actually know what the official word, the little razor blades that have a little cardboard around them. Even those are great. Like you can single use them. They're sturdy enough to um, kind of, as Chris was mentioning, it's very difficult to scrape down to metal surfaces on cars, but those work great. And then you can just kind of dispose of them when you're done to kind of ensure there's no cross contamination. Uh, we really uh, love when you give us packaging that is larger than the item. So we have to get into the item and then put it back in there and seal it. And when it's just crammed in there and there's not a lot of room, it makes things a little challenging for us. So use packaging that's a little bit larger than you think you need. And if you're worried about things, um, you know, getting misplaced or whatever, that's where that uh, double layer system, which again, we'll talk a little bit more, is really great. And again, just make sure that any uh, evidence tape isn't, gonna, or any sort of tape is gonna come into contact with the evidence. Uh, as Chris was mentioning about what standards and stuff we need, um, for anything that has a two-way transfer, we're gonna ask for a minimum of four samples. So again, we want a standard from each of the vehicles involved in the, or. I should say vehicles or objects that are involved, and then damage the damaged areas as well. And they each need to be packaged separately. And again, there's just this note on here to remember what Chris said about the clear coat kind of looking white when it's abraded. Just don't assume. Probably like my one fun tip that I love to tell people when they, you know, ask about paint, which is that I'm always just like, white stuff, don't mean it's a white car. We're nerds. Um, so like, again, Chris had mentioned that if you are able to cut out this section of like the plastic bumper or whatever, that's great. We always appreciate that or, you know, submit the whole item. Um, and again, just a reminder that um, blades or scalpels are really great single use items. Uh, obviously, we understand that sometimes, you know, you, you may not have that 
Um, so just kind of make sure that you are cleaning your pocket knife, like even just washing it with soap and water and letting it dry is great to kind of make sure that all of those little bits of debris or previous paint or whatever is, is all out of the little nooks and crannies. And putting them into the post-it or paper fold and then putting in a larger bag is wonderful. We will love you so much for that. So some of the, I mean, if you, we talked about the paper folds and the um, post-its, but you could also use like little, we've seen the little plastic containers or um, metal canisters can, can house little objects in there just great. Um, again, if the items are dry, they're fine to be put in plastic bags for the outer layer. But if there's anything that's damp, uh, we really do ask that you put them in a sealed paper bag or envelope. And again, just kind of make sure if you are using um, a paper fold, uh, don't tape it. If you do the paper fold correctly, there's really no need for tape. Here is a lovely picture of what we would love to see in any sort of paint cases. So at the, at the top here, uh, you can see all of these little scrapings of the paint. You can put that on the adhesive strip of the post-it, fold it down with your case number and where the paint was collected from, and put it in another uh, overpack. And that is just perfect. Here is the uh, link and what we give our crime scene people. They have a little trace evidence collection kit. Uh, you saw this last week. Uh, this link, um, Chris will put into the chat box right now if you want a live link. Uh, if you do go there, please note that it will take you to the news, the entire newsletter. And so you'll kind of have to download it and then you'll be able to uh, get more information about this once you've downloaded that newsletter. Um, yes, um, Chris is just saying that in this picture, you'll see it's kind of hard from this photo, but these are the disposable uh, scalpels. And these are those type of razor blades that I was unsure what they were called, but this is what I was referring to. Those are perfect for any sort of paint collection. And so the links um, to where you can get some of those will, will be found there. <laughs> and again, this was a repeat from last week, but this is how you do a proper paper fold. And, you know, it really is just a really good skill for you all to know. So, um, you know, you can practice on any paper you are just going to get rid of. It's, it's fun. All right. And I will turn it back over to Chris. All right. Yes, now we have homework for them is to practice your <laughs> paper fold and just find some random car in the street and scrape some paint off of it. No, not really. Um, OK, so let's look at a few more case examples. Um, this one is a, a typical paint case where we had a blue car and it's a metallic blue car and we see what looks like white transfer smeared across it. So that's the question paint. And we received a white paint standard, the known standard from a white car. It looks white, um, just kind of to the naked eye in this photo. But if the light caught it just right, or you looked at it under the microscope, that white layer actually had multicolored sparkly pigments in there. So this made it a little more unusual than just your typical solid white paint. So what we do under the microscope is we, we take the scalpel and we sample this white smear and we will compare it using the techniques I explained earlier to the standard from the white car. And I guess I didn't finish that case, but yeah, yes, it was associated. This one is a little more unusual and so the findings would be more um, strong at the end of our association. So we have a vehicle to vehicle impact. The first vehicle is a black Kia with just your <clears throat> excuse me, typical four layer OEM paint. The second vehicle, however, was like a vintage blue, teal blue Ford pickup. And it had an unusual layer structure in that it was four layers, but it was teal, gray, teal, and then brown, no clear coat, um, no real uh, second primer layer, which is very unusual. 
And the second teal coat was a very unusual paint chemistry of a type that is not usually seen on modern vehicles. And so there isn't a lot of it on the road. We got the Kia sample and we saw both types of the teal paints that were associated with the Ford, as well as the brown paint. So three of the four layers found on the Ford standard were present on the Kia, but that we were trying to answer, did they hit each other? There was also some gray paint seen, but it was unfortunately um, present in too small of an amount to analyze it. And then on the Ford itself, when we looked at it, among the paint chips submitted for the Ford standard, we saw some black paint chips and those were compared to the Kia standard and were found to be consistent in all four layers. So we have two-way transfer, we have um, black paint on teal vehicle, teal paint on black vehicle, and we have this really unusual uh, teal chemistry and just overall unusual Ford paint layer structure, um, totally. So in this situation, we have a conclusion that explains that the um, paint from one was found on the vehicle of the other and vice versa. And then in this situation, the report includes an opinion statement by me that says that this two-way transfer demonstrates strong support for the premise of contact between these two specific vehicles. So that's a lot um, more, that's more strongly worded than you would see on a typical report where we had fewer unusual features where we just say it could have come from this source or from another vehicle with the same exact characteristic. So a question we get a lot is how long does paint analysis take? As I said, we've currently got two people for the entire state plus one more in training. We think he'll be done by the end of 2021. Um, and paint cases really vary in how long they take. Sometimes they only take a day, sometimes they take a week. And then of course, all of our casework goes through 100% technical review by another qualified analyst. The work that we do here may be delayed if we don't get adequate standards and we have to contact you and ask for more, or if the reports don't give us the information that details the collection of the submitted evidence. And I, I have that emphasized because we get police reports all the time that have a dozen witness statements and a bunch of information, but they don't ever talk about the evidence that we got. And that's the stuff we really need. So even if you're just writing two paragraphs just for us, that's awesome. Just give that to us. We don't need we don't need what everybody else said or saw, but we do need to know where is this evidence from? Where did you collect it from? Our current turnaround time for paint is about 75 days or less, which we feel is pretty good. Um, and it should decrease once we get that third analyst qualified. When we go to court, as with all um, forensic work, we can explain our procedures and how they are accepted in the field. We explain our findings for any given case, the meanings and limitations of those findings. We may be able to offer expert opinions about the significance. And of course, we can always talk about our lab's accreditation status and our QA protocols. So just a couple reminders as we're wrapping up. So, Paint is physical evidence, so we remember that we cannot individualize a source to the exclusion of all others because it is mass produced, but it can establish a link between a person or an object or two objects that an event occurred that allowed transfer of paint between them. And in some of these events, biological evidence is not transferred or is not probative. Our lab analysis is only as good as the evidence collection done by you. So please think ahead, collect standards, even if you don't know they'll be used later, and collect question paints, even if you don't have a standard yet. Um, there's, there's nothing worse than hindsight and knowing that you missed out on a collection that you can't go back and do. And then think about the possibility of multiple associations um, where you ha might have glass plus paint plus fibers. Um, the more those associations are cumulative, the better picture we can paint for a jury about the possibility of the contact. And then specifically for vehicle paints, reminders about we need standards from each different part of vehicles that have damage from uh, what you think is the event. Metal and plastic parts need separate standards, OEM versus the 
paired parts meet different standards. Be alert for two-way transfer possibilities and collect those controls or comparison standards near the damage as near as possible, and then also collect the area with the paint transfer. So you'll have minimum of four samples for one two-way contact analysis. Remember that transfer from impact may only include the topmost layers, um, but that's fine. We will analyze the layers that we have. Think about physical fits in those rare cases where you have large chips and collect those paint chips or painted vehicle parts from the ground if it looks like they came from an impact. The more parts that you collect, paint chips and parts, the better chance there is that we will have something useful to work with to help your investigation. Never package paint onto strong adhesive, although post-it notes are fine, uh, or use lift tape for paint evidence. It will contaminate it and we will reject it. And then be sure to package every sample separately with information about the location you collected it from. And then Carly's favorite thing, remember clear coats can look abraded when they, or can look white when they are abraded. All right, Carly's gonna put the link again to the physical evidence manual in the chat. I think the question that we saw, we really do like those single use safety razor blades or single use scalpels. Um, they're not that expensive. And if you carry them around in, you know, if you make one of those trace kits and carry them around in your vehicle so that they are at hand when you need them, um, I think you will appreciate it. So I'm going to stop presenting. And See if there are any further questions. Maybe. So the question is, if we have an unknown painted vehicle part, can we determine the manufacturer? Um, that is the subject of next week's presentation. In part, we're going to talk about determining or looking for investigative leads from unknown vehicles with both painted parts and also parts that aren't painted but may have manufacturer's codes on there. So if I could postpone a full answer, you'll have to wait a week. You know, it's just like a suspense cliffhanger. Um, the answer is maybe, and we'll tell you how. Oh, sure. Probably it's suggesting we open one of these scalpels and put it on the video. <laughs> Barely see myself, but um, so it's in a little disposable wrapper. Um, it's got a little lid, and just a single. Use, oops, <laughs> sorry, my goodness. Um, and you can just use that to scrape your your paint, and then you can put the lid on it and get rid of it. And like I said, and I think cost-wise, those cost about a dollar fifty each, so they're not a huge expense. And you know, think about the frequency of of your using them, it's probably not gonna break the bank or anything like that. Certainly less than a body swab. And I think we are pretty much out of time. I'll just wait a moment to see if there are any final questions. And as I'm waiting, I will say that um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Uh, I'll send out the slides ahead of time. And if you haven't put your name in, if you are not logged in separately under your own name, but are just kind of tagging along, please add that to the chat before you go. All right, thank you everybody. We'll say goodbye until next week.